we uh, do what we feel the Lord wants us to. And uh, it doesn't seem to come out right. Did you ever have that happen to you? And there are times when you do the right thing and it still doesn't come out right or doesn't seem to. That's sort of what this song is about. But there's a way that it's all going to come out. And uh, that's what the song about. That's an old familiar one. You can join in with me on the chorus if you will. Now there have been times when giving and loving brought pain, and I promised I would never let it happen again. But I found out that loving is well. scared me so I forgot the second verse. And it must... <laughs> uh, Jesus showed me that only through dying we live. And... Boy, I really lost that one, didn't I? Let's see. Oh, and he gave when it seemed. And he gave when it seemed there was no more to give. Sing it out. Come on. I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love till there's just no more love. For I could never, never have loved my Lord. How many of you now, I want you to think about what we sang, and if you really mean it, sing it this time to the Lord, just, just as a prayer offering to the Lord. If you really mean it, think of it, let the words really sink in this time. Come on. I'm going to live the way he wants me to live. I'm going to give until that just no more to give. Give him glory 
and honor and power, King Jesus, to his majesty, we lift up holy hands, Lord, we praise you, we love you, adore you. I just praise the Lord for people who pray and people who care. You know, uh, for several weeks now, I have been laboring under some tremendous load, and I didn't realize until just uh, very recently what it was. I've been the object of a lot of psychic praying that's coming in, and Sunday it snapped off of me. The devil rang my bell, and I've come out of the corner fighting. And um, I want you to turn to Galatians. We're going to talk about grace and how easy it is to slide into works. One of the biggest death traps for believers is to move from the grace principle into the works principle and go into the Galatian heresy. All of those who teach perfection in this life and talk about absolute sanctification while you're in these bodies. Every one of them move into the Galatian heresy without exception. Now this old gray-headed fox has been around a long time. I've seen a lot of things. I've heard a lot of things. A lot of these little uh, ringy-dinks that are running around, I've heard them. I've seen them before. I've seen them tried. I ain't seen them produce yet. I hear a lot of talk about holiness. I don't see a lot of it. When I get in the midst of the Holy, the Holy Joes, I find out they're just about as unholy as the rest of us. They're just not as honest. They don't admit they still have problems. If you get holy enough, you don't need deliverance. How could you? You're so sweet, so wonderful. That's a lie, people. Jesus did not worship and praise demons out of anybody. He commanded them in his name to come out. There's been no change. Hagwish is still on course. She will remain that way. We've been through shakings over and over again as people have tried to change the course of this church. I've been here longer than anybody. I've survived all the shakings. This old Texas Longhorn's got long, jagged scars on his hide. I've been wounded by experts. But I'm still here. And I'm telling you this, people. Stay with the basic fundamentals of the faith. Stay with the simplicity of the gospel. Don't get caught up in a bunch of airy fantasisms. Theological fantasies that lead nowhere. Except bitter disappointment. Let's look at Galatia. Paul had gone through and established grace. The heresies are always, and the, and the false teachings and the things that draw sincere believers into traps that lead nowhere are always based on a leading away from the grace principle. 
You see, grace is the exclusive prerogative of our God. Not one of the religions that devil, the devil has created, not one of the churches the devil has infiltrated teaches grace. They all teach works, disguised in one way or another. You're either working your way trying to get saved, you're working your way trying to keep saved, you're working your way trying to get in God's favor, you're, you're working your way in order to manipulate God. Friends, you can't keep God's law in order to make him do something you want him to do. Did you know that? That is a monstrous thing to think you can manipulate our God. We are to find out what God wants us to be and to, and to get to flowing in the direction God wants and then he begins to work miracles. Amen? Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul was one who was challenged constantly because he stayed on the trail while others buried. While others went here, there, and yonder, he stayed on the trail. That'll make you very unpopular. Your old hats, you're out of date. Your message is dated. Well, <laughs> the message is pretty old, that's right. And if we stay close to it, we're going to be dated. This old modern world is never going to keep in step. The modern church is not going to keep in step. You see, everybody's looking for something instant. Everybody wants it to happen now or tomorrow or next week for sure. And somebody told me something, one of our members told me something the last day or so that really struck with me, and I think it's true. He said, you know, I prayed about it, and the Lord showed me. He said, Hegwish is building a foundation for something. And you know, if you did you ever go out and watch somebody build a, build a house? They go out there and they spend so much time measuring and digging and pouring and then they go back and they measure. Everything has to be just exactly so. And you know, you feel like getting out there and say, oh, quit fooling around with this stuff. Let's get the building up. I want to see what the building looks like. You know what happens if they build the building before the foundation is sure? What's going to happen? I don't care how pretty the building is. It's going to crack and crumble. It's going to come down. A sure foundation is necessary. And a foundation is built on foundation truths. And God is moving his people towards something that will not blow away. The great outpouring of God in the past, every one of them has blown, been blown away because people changed and went to something else after they got on the right track. The Azusa Street outpouring at the turn of the century was a marvelous move of God, a sovereign work of God. Did you know it didn't come about because somebody tried to manipulate God? It came about because people were just uh, waiting before the Lord, hungry for what, the, uh, asking God to do what he wanted to do, and bluey, he hit like a bombshell. And he did far more than they ever thought about. They couldn't have even thought to ask what he did. And miracles popped everywhere, deliverance began. But you know, era crept into Azusa, the Azusa Street meetings eventually, and poisoned it, polluted it, watered it down, and it ended up creating splinters, spasms, and squasms, and everything else. And the revival died. And so has come every move of God. The enemy has managed to get in, infiltrate, and take it away from the grace principles where it started. You cannot manipulate God. That is a heresy era that the enemy would like to put in every one of our minds. That if I do this, then God's got to do this. I've got news for you. Almighty God doesn't have to do anything. You and I are to find out what he wants and flow with him. And if we do that, we're going to get overwhelmed with blessings. There's no doubt about that. Now, there's a lot of twistings and turnings before you find out where that flow is. And even after you dabble in it a while, you still have to find out there's still more yet to go. A lot of these people are perfect. Oh, they have attained. They have attained. Let me tell you something. The great apostle Paul at the end of his life said, I have not yet attained, but I'm still pressing toward the mark. You have the goal up ahead of you. Paul didn't make it. By that I mean he didn't hit the goal he was aiming for. But he was pressing toward it. And if he didn't attain it, I don't want to hear from any of these pipsqueaks that come around and tell me they've attained. 
I mean, I haven't seen any of the Apostle Pauls run around, have you? They're going to have to produce more than I've seen. I, and I've seen quite a bit. I've gone and investigated a lot of things. Because I wanted to know if God was doing something. What you do, you move into the mortal and venal sins. Anybody ever hear of that? The mortal sins mean you, you're not sanctified. The venal sins, that's what I do, but it's all right. That doesn't keep me from being sanctified. The mortal sins are the dra dreadful, gross things that you're doing. The sins of omission, which I've overlooked, are all right, but I'm still sanctified and floating in space. I'm sorry, people. I want something more down to earth than that. I want something that will change my life, don't you? The way a lot of people go at it, you might as well go build some convents and monasteries. Hmm? Throw away the home. Throw away the family. Hmm? Does this sound familiar? Look around you and watch what's happening. You see, if the devil can't get you with something good, he'll come at you with something that looks good. If he can't get you with something bad, he'll get you with something that's good. Or seems to be when it starts. Paul was an apostle. He wasn't from men. He wasn't by man. He didn't get his authority from men. He uh, got it from Jesus Christ. And God the Father raised him from the dead. He said, I don't go back. I didn't draw my papers from any of the boards. I'll tell you this much. If God calls a man to preach, then he's responsible to God. If the board calls him to preach, he's responsible to the board. If the denomination calls him to preach, then he has to answer to that denomination. And many people are answering to the denominations. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, when he just won't go very far because he's just that old Baptist. You know, he's got that old Baptist doctrine. In the first place, they don't even know what Baptist doctrine is. And the second place, when I was a Baptist, they called me a maverick over there. Because I felt like I was called, called of God to preach the Word of God and teach the people the Word of God. And that's all I was chargeable to. And I ran around, because, ran around with folks because I wouldn't promote the programs. I'm still not promoting any program. I still think the chief job that I have is to give people the Word of God and get them started for themselves. They're going to grow. They're not. They're not going to grow like mushrooms because if they, you know, mushrooms grow up overnight and they die overnight too. But if they grow, you know, an oak grows slowly, doesn't it? It lasts a long time. God's growing some oaks in His His forest. Did you know that? It takes a while, but they make a strong tree. All the brethren which are with me. He said, under the churches in Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God our, the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing he does, he throws grace at them and peace. Grace and peace are spirits of the Lord that you and I need daily. Every time you read one of these letters, the first thing it starts with is grace. Grace and peace. Those are things we need. Because the devil is working constantly to get us away from the grace principle into the works principle. James spells it out without any doubt, shadow of doubt. You can't have both. You gotta have. It's either be. You gotta go one way or the other. Paul makes no bones about it. If you're working, if you're working to get saved, then you're not saved by grace. If you're saved by grace, you can't work for it. There's no way you can mix the two. There's no way you can mix them up. What had happened in Galatia? Paul had established a church on the pillars of grace, God's grace. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something you don't deserve, but you got it anyway. Grace means that God loved you not because you deserve loving, but because you needed loving. God didn't love me because I deserved it or because I ever would deserve it. He loved me because I needed it desperately and there was no other way I could get any help. My desperate need, your desperate need of God caused his grace to move. The law came by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, grace to you and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself 
for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Now some people might read that and say, yes, we're going to be delivered right out of this world. But you read another place where Paul writes and he says, I don't tell you to leave this world because you've got to live in it. Well, you can look forward to being delivered out of this world. This world, you know the old song, this world's not my home, I'm just a passing through? That's right. Boy, I'm glad I'm not going to stay here always, aren't you? You say, how do you know you're not? Because I have the promises of God. You say, oh, but supposing, Brother Worley, that after you've walked these many years, that you should turn aside, and then God would call you home, and oh, oh, it would all be lost. Well, it would if it depended on me. But my salvation has never depended on me. It's always depended on Jesus. He, had, he hadn't changed. Listen, when God saved me, he didn't put me walking on a razor blade. Doing a tightrope walk on a razor blade and saying, Oh, I must be so careful because if I'm not holy, I must go to hell. The fear motive is driving most people in churches. Did you know that? If I don't pray my prayers, if I don't circle the beads, if I don't make so many services, if I don't dip in the water, if I don't hoop and holler and pray and, sw and float and swoon when everybody else does, I may not be holy enough to get there. It comes in many guises. It's all works, people. It's all works. And we're saved by grace. You say, well, then it doesn't matter how you live. Oh, yes, it does. There are rewards. I never hear these perfection boys preach on rewards. They've practically got it all in their side pocket now. And yet if you get around them, you'll see demons dancing in their eyes. But they don't, have, they don't need any deliverance. How could you deliver them? You're carnal. They're spiritual. Hmm? See the, you see the, the fallacy, the lie that comes in to deceive people? We're going to need deliverance, people, because the enemy has infiltrated. But the good news is we don't have to give over to that. We can fight it, we can battle it, and we can do something about it in our own lives and the lives of others. And we don't have to talk about it. We can follow God's program and it'll be produced in and through us. Oh, it won't be an instant thing. <laughs> oh, boy, sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off, sometimes it's back, sometimes it's forward. Did you ever feel like that? Did you ever feel like a yo-yo on a string? I mean, boy, today, hallelujah, tomorrow, boom, I hit the bottom. You didn't do that, did you? You're holier than that, aren't you? Hmm? Are you human enough to admit that that's been, that has happened to you at different times? Now, what we have to do is find out what it is that keeps us up and what it is that puts us down. And move our lives in harmony with those, those principles that cause our lives to soar and to be lifted up. And when you investigate, it's going to be grace. When you begin to understand God's love and grace, that's when you're going to be lifted up. When you're moving into an area and you're working and you're striving to attain holiness or whatever. That striving and the servant of the Lord shall not strive. The testimony of James Robinson in Charisma said that he preached with great burning fervor for years. And people flocked out to the meetings and he was a great successful evangelist. And he thought he was just filled with the power of God because he thundered forth and he yelled his message. And he found out that all that was was demon power. In the pulpit, preaching truth by demon power. And you think the devil's not sly? You think he can't appear? Why, my Bible says he can appear as an angel of light. And no marvel. His ministers come as angels of light many times. Now, we shouldn't move in fear, but in knowledge and understanding. If you read and study the little book of Galatians, it's a short book. It's not long. But it tells about how a group of people, solidly based on grace, solidly based on the love of God, 
rejoicing, praising Jesus. The gifts were operating. Deliverance was proceeding. And then some people came through who said, oh, you're doing it all wrong. They said, huh? Oh, well, we want to do it right. How do you do it right? Oh, well, this is the way. And they put them under bondage. And before they got through, they were bound, 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 and the spiritual life and ebb, ebbed to a stop in Galatia. And Paul writes this letter because of this. Verse 6, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He said, I am just flabbergasted to hear what a short time it took for you to be moved from him who calls you. What did he call him into? Into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul had called them out of their darkness into Jesus' marvelous light. And he said, I am amazed that so soon somebody else could come along and call you. You could be removed from him. And he said, it called you to another gospel, which is not another. He said, there really isn't another gospel. It's a counterfeit. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert or twist the gospel. Now, there are some people who say, you're not born again when you ask Jesus in your heart. You're just prepared to press in, to hope, to somehow one day get it. Well, you might as well go back to the Catholic Church. They have a better program than that. At least it's spelled out clearer. I mean, you know, you know what you got to do. You got to be baptized. You got to make communion. You got to make confession. You got to make the round, the round beads, and, and you got to do certain things, and and then you'll be saved, perhaps, if you got enough money to pay for uh, to get out of purgatory. You know. I mean, they've got a pretty good system going like that. I don't know why you need to come up with something else if you want that type of system. And there are others that come along and say, oh, you better follow me because you're going to fall away. Fall away from what? If you're resting in grace. Did you know that grace is like a mighty ocean? It's like we're on the boat. And the law of God comes up and says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. <gasps> Ooh. Wages of sin is death. There's no escape from that law. And you back up on the edge of the boat, and you back up, and you back up, and you fall into grace. That's the only way you can go. The law was meant to back you in the corner so you could see you couldn't get saved except by the grace of God. Desperation, you leap overboard into the ocean of God's grace, and you accept his free offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, when you're in grace... You can fall deeper into grace, but you can't fall out. Did you ever see anybody fall out of the ocean? You can fall in it, and you can even go deeper in it, but you can't fall out of it. Friend, when you fell in, or when you fell or leaped or whatever you did into the arms of Jesus, you leaped into grace. Now he tells the Galatians, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That accursed is a strong term. It means let him be cut off without hope. He said if somebody comes through there and preaches a different gospel, if even an angel from heaven comes and preaches another gospel, let him be cut off. One of the ways that you know whether a ministry is valid, you find out if they know what they're talking about, about how to get people born again. And friend, if they don't know how, if they don't have a clear-cut biblical understanding of how a person is saved from their sins, then nothing else they do is valid. Did you know that? A lot of things can be done by witchcraft that look religious and nice. 
And if a person is wrong on salvation, you can mark it down, they're wrong on a lot of other things. Hmm? Think it through. If they're wrong on the virgin birth, you well might draw back. If they're wrong on the resurrection of Jesus, you well might back up and watch out. Any of the cardinal things. Now, there are a lot of things that Christians can differ on. People can say there's no such thing as deliverance. Well, I think they're wrong, but I can live with that. But when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, when it comes to the virgin birth, when it comes to the sinless life, when it comes to the absolute verity of the blood of Jesus being the only way to save sinners, when, the plan, when it comes to the plan of salvation, there's no, there's no leeway there. I mean, you've got to be straight on that. If you're crooked on that, you're crooked in a lot of other ways. There's no way you can be straight if you've got, you got a barn door open like that. You might disagree on some other doctrines, but on the cardinal virtues of faith, and especially the plan of salvation, you better be straight. Because if you're not right on the plan of salvation, you're not right on anything, are you? How could you be? No matter how many people you gather together, if you're wrong on the plan of salvation, what do you got? The Hindus have got a lot going, but they're wrong on the plan of salvation. The Buddhists have a lot going. They're wrong on the plan of salvation. Every other false religion and cult you can mention has a lot going for it, but they're wrong on the plan of salvation. Be sure when you're evaluating something, people know what they're talking about, about how to get people saved. If they don't know how to get people saved, then they're filled with deception. I don't care how good it looks. I don't care how sweet it is, how lovely it is. Listen, some of you are former drug addicts. You remember the good trips where you drifted off into euphoria and you just had the most beautiful, glorious experiences and, and you floated and it was just un, so beautiful, it was painful, it was just so lovely and wonderful. You see, you can't go by that. Because otherwise you'd come back and say, well, I've, I've touched God. I never will forget years ago, there was a young man came, a, a young sailor lad, and he came to me and he said, um, he, was, he said he was called to preach. And he seemed to be a precious, very sincere young man. And he and his little girlfriend came. And uh, he, uh, we were talking and he, he said, um, I said, well, how do you know you're called to preach? He said, well, he, uh, he said, I was, uh, I was smoking marijuana and, this, and, and, I, and a, a beautiful angel came and he ushered me right. Now, this, he was dead serious. A beautiful angel took me right into the presence of God and he said, preach my word. And said it was so beautiful and, and tears came in his eyes. It was just such a move. Even to remember the experience was so moving. And he said, so I know God has called me. And... Uh, and he said, but now he'd gotten to where he questioned whether the drugs were really right, but it seemed like he felt closer to God when he was on the drugs. Turned out he'd never been saved at all. But he was a, he was a young man with a hunger in his heart for spiritual things, and the devil put drugs in his hands and led him down a religious trail. The devil knew what he was looking for, and so he supplied him a counterfeit experience. And for a long time, he'd been going around convinced he was preaching and, and he was to call people to God and everything else. He got saved there that night in the living room. Hallelujah. And then we got those spirits out of him. That had been deluding him. Thank God. We didn't worship them out. We didn't praise them out. We cast them out in Jesus' name. They didn't want to come out either. They were very reluctant. They were very upset. <laughs> Isn't that too bad? They were far more upset where they went. <laughs> well, you see what I'm talking about, people? It doesn't matter about how you, you... You've got to evaluate things on the basis of biblical foundational truths. Not on what some glorious, marvelous theological theorem says. Hmm? 
somebody asked me uh, just recently, said, well, don't you think I ought to meditate on the attributes of God? I said, no, you're crazy as a Bessie bug now from doing that. <laughs> I, I tend to be outspoken when there's, when it's foolishness. That was, I mean, I mean, he was deceived. You say, why did you talk so rough to him? I was using the shock treat. I was trying to shock him out of his stupidity. He was caught in it. He'd been encouraged in it by people who thought he was spouting off wonderfully. Talking to him was like punching a button and on came a demonic recording singing a religious song. Oh, lo, 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 beautiful theological theory. I said, you are spinning semantic and theological philosophical nonsense and fantasy. I said, get out of your fantasy world and learn about the grace of God and how much Jesus loves. Well, I'm afraid I'll be deceived. I said, you already have been. <laughs> Come out of it. You need to be delivered out of that. He said, well, I don't know how. I said, I'll tell you how. And I told him, and then he punched the button, and off we went on another theological trip through the heavenlies. Oh, but I just want to see the beauty of God. I said, you will when you get understand the grace of Jesus and how he could love sinners like you and me. I said, get one, get, run the references on the grace of God and on the love of Jesus, and then press it close to your heart and say, Lord, and just say, Lord, Father, show me, show me how this relates to me. Make it real to me. And I said, when even one verse becomes to, becomes to come alive to you of how the grace of God caused Jesus to love you and so love, I said, you, you'll find all of this. And he said, well, shouldn't I seek a perfect theology? I said, no. There's no such thing. I said, try to find out and understand just a little of the grace of God. That's what you need. That's what you're hungry for. You say, did he do it? I don't think so. He was th still on theological fantasy trail train when he left. Spinning theological. He said, well, do you think I ought to go to Bible school? I said, Lord, have mercy. No. I said, you've already got enough theological nonsense in your head now. You can't sort out what you've got. I said, somewhere you picked up, he'd gone through cults and everything else. I said, you picked up all kinds of garbage already. What you need to do is unload, not load some more in the truck. How do you do it? Get to the simplicity of the gospel. Go back to where the simple foundations lie. He said, if we are an angel, he said, Paul said, if I come back and preach another gospel, if I come back and I've lost my mind and I'm preaching another gospel, you should reject it. How about that? Gospel means good news. Or an angel from heaven. He said, if they preach any other gospel than that that we preach to you, let him be a curse. Let him be cut off. That's an extremely strong term. I mean, he's not playing tiddlywinks. He's not playing Mr. Nice guy. He's just saying, let him be cut off, accursed from God. He thinks that that kind of thing is the rottenest thing that can be done. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that, he have received, verse 9, let him be accursed. He said, in case you, did, you thought I, I was stammering when I said it the first time, let me say it again. I meant just what I said. And they say, well, you should speak sweetly and lovely to the people. Well, he is. He loves the people so much that he will not allow false teaching to come up without branding it for what it is. And he said, don't kid yourself. I am saying, let him be a curse. That's what I meant. He says it twice. Now, he says, <laughs> now, do I seek to persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Evidently, over in Galatia, there had been some who came and said, well, you know, Paul, he preaches that old easy grace thing, you know, because that pleases, it's an ear pleaser, it's a crowd pleaser. But it's really practical, but, you know, it doesn't make much sense. But, you know, whoever heard of grace, whoever, you, you know, we live in this world, we know you get nothing, you don't get something for nothing. The devil tells you that all the time, you don't get something for nothing. 
You don't accept from God. Only when you deal with God. And he said, now, he said, am I seeking to please men now? He said, you think I'm trying to get the crowd on my side? He said, well, no. Because remember, he's writing to a bunch who've already been sucked under. They have swallowed this thing hook, line, and sinker. And Paul turns around and says, stop! It's wickedness. It's heresy. Now, he says, now am I trying to please men? Am I trying to be popular? Be sure I please everybody, not ruffle anybody's feathers. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He said, I want to certify something to you, boys. He said, what I preached to you didn't come from man. What these boys have trotted in with came from man. But the gospel that I gave you did not come from man. That's why I can stand behind it. I know that it's God's gospel. Now, of course, today, if somebody did something like that, they say, oh, he's so conceited. He just thinks he knows it all. Hmm? You can't talk to him. You know, he's so, he's so unreasonable. He won't listen to anything new. He wouldn't take anything of this kind of new. Nothing that would change the fundamentals was acceptable to the Apostle Paul. Nothing that would change the fundamentals of the faith was acceptable. And he didn't care whether people liked it or not. He said, this gospel of priest to me was not after men. I neither received it of man. He said, I didn't get this from another man. I wasn't taught it. It came by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, a lot of people now are saying, well, you know, this that I have is by revelation. Okay, if it is, it will check out with this book. If it doesn't check with this book, it's false. And I don't care how many people embrace it. I don't care how many people like it, think it's wonderful. If it won't check by the book, it won't check. And you'll notice, too, that I'm going verse by verse through the scriptures. One, you know, if you want to prove something that's hard to prove and almost impossible to prove, you do a proof text sermon. You know what that is? You hop in Genesis and then you go to Revelation, you come back to Romans, then you go to uh, Jeremiah, and then you hop, 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 like popcorn. Now, I'm not saying that's never in order, but if that's all the kind of preaching somebody does, you better watch it. You can prove absolutely anything from the scriptures. And you know, I've told you this before, I can prove to you from the scriptures, using nothing but scripture, that you ought to commit suicide and you ought to do it right away. Judas went out and hanged himself. That's scripture. Jesus said, go thou and do likewise. That's scripture. And that which thou doest, do quickly. I proved it by the scripture. Now this is how you prove false teachings. Now don't misunderstand me. Let me say it carefully so you don't misunderstand. Next time you hear a preacher going from scripture to scripture, and I may do it myself. Don't say, oh, oh, he's off. He well might be on. But when he starts doing that, be sure you write them down and you go check them and see if they harmonize with the whole scripture. I personally prefer and enjoy myself a passage of scripture going verse by verse and seeing what is in this book. This is the way they were written. The books were written and then pulling in other applicable scripture to buttress the truth that is being put forth in this scripture. Most of you have gotten accustomed to this, and you're really spoiled to it. Because when you go someplace else and they don't do that, you think, well, we should preach, preach the word. Because you're used to going verse by verse. You know why you like it? You know why it lasts? There's method in my madness. I, rec I recognize I'm not near smart enough. In the first place, I know a great deal. I'm sure of that. But even if I did know a great deal, no matter how well or eloquently I preached, 
you would not receive, be able to understand, with, receive with understanding many of the truths that are presented. But if I can preach to you verse by verse through the scriptures, then every time you pick up those scriptures, then the truth that God has put in there will come back to you and be reinforced. The markings maybe that you made in your Bible, the little marks or maybe a note or a word or two you put in the margin to help you remember something about that verse will come alive when you come back to those scriptures. This, the, well, this is what's called, well, I'll give you a lesson in uh, homiletics. I did take a course in it. That's, that's, uh, you say, what is that? Sounds like a disease. No, it's not a disease. It's, uh, it's sermon belly, how you preach sermons. You see, there are different kinds of sermons. There's a, there's a textual sermon. That's where you take one verse and you read it, or maybe two or three verses, and then uh, you, you can, from that, you can do what's called a springboard sermon. You read your text, because after all, you're preaching, and then you quickly depart as far as possible away from it. But you read the verse, so you, they, everybody knows it's a sermon. And then you go ahead and tell the people what you want to do. Well, there are certain topics, and, and that's a topical message. You, you build your sermon around topics. And then there are other little variations of it. But the thing that lasts the longest, according to any Bible school seminar you want to go to, the thing that will stay the longest with the people is what they call expository preaching, which is where you go verse by verse, and expository means to expose, that is to turn up the scripture and look at it and try to understand what it is saying. It also, in order to do this, you must not read into the scripture these things. You have to read it out of the scripture. In other words, it has to be there. Don't read it into the scripture. Well, Paul didn't receive this from God. He, did, he wasn't taught it by man. Uh, he didn't receive it from man, excuse me. He, didn't, he wasn't taught it. He had it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You say, well, I've got my revelation too. I know, but we've got one that uh, has yours outgunned. Your revelation is brand new. You say, no, I got it several years ago. It's still brand new. Here's a revelation that's hundreds of years old, and it stood the test of time. Now, if your revelation is from God, we know God doesn't change. He doesn't stutter. He says the same things. Basically, he won't vary from his principles. So when we lay your revelation alongside of this revelation, it ought to jihaw. Hmm? And if it crosses and it differs in vital points from this revelation, if the principles thereof are wrong and are diametrically opposed to this, then you're an error. You say, oh, but an angel delivered this to me. It was glorious. I was caught up in the spirit. I have no doubt that you were. You see, believers have underestimated the power of the enemy to imitate the truth. You see, God made the truth so simple. He made, he made salvation so simple that a child could get to it. And then men have come along and made it complex and complicated so that you could never get to it. How about these people, you know, that, well, when you ask Jesus in your heart, you're just getting started toward that gets you a chance to possibly maybe one day get born again. What happens to the children in that case? Hmm? The children will never make it, will they? It's too complicated. Even grown people have trouble understanding it. What are the kids going to do? But you know something? Jesus Christ made salvation so simple that even a child could open the door. Wow, that's grace, isn't it? When you get into the scriptures, you find out the basic precepts of scripture, the main things that are to cause us to live and to, and to come alive are so simple. They're like falling over, you, you almost fall over them. They're so simple you think, how could that be? It couldn't be that easy. If you want to start a new religion, the thing you do, you make it real hard to get in. Did you know that? You have all kinds of difficult feats that you have to do and, and all this sort of thing. 
But you promise the people power. You promise them life. You promise them fulfillment. And your building will fill up with dodo birds. <laughs> Barnum said it. He said there's a sucker born every minute. And I think there's, there's two religious suckers born every minute. If you make it crazy and cockeyed enough, if it's, if it's disjointed enough, it will attract people. It's unbelievable. But on the other hand, if you preach just the plain truth, it's so simple that even a child can begin to apprehend the basic principles and that men and women can begin to dig in the scripture for themselves. They can begin to pray for themselves. They can begin to move in this thing themselves. They think, oh, that's so simple, you know. I was looking for something more of a challenge. You have never been challenged till you try to get in those simple things and, and begin to, to make them work in the face of the adversary. That's where the glory comes down when Jesus begins to move. Well, our time has run out. We're going to have to stop there. But I would encourage you to get into Galatians and find out about Galatia and how he talks about them. He said, I marvel that someone has bewitched you, cast a witchcraft spell over you so that you cannot see the truth. You, he said, who understood so clearly, how in the world could you be hoodwinked? Read it closely and with benefit and praise God for the simplicity of the gospel. He fixed it so even people who are not real smart could understand it. Aren't you glad? And even smart folks can understand it. See, he fixed it so everybody could get in. An old professor I had in, in seminary one time said, boys, put the cookies on the lower shelf. Don't sail off in the theological clouds. Most people don't have a ladder. They'll never get them if you put them on the top shelf. Put them on the lower shelf and then the kiddies and everybody can get them. He said the truths of Scripture are so simple and so basic and so foundational that when they come down. And this is another thing. Watch out for all these veiled teachings that are so complicated. And I don't know whether you can receive this because it's so you. I don't know whether you're spiritual enough to receive these marvelous revelations. You better be glad you're not tuned in on those spirits. Because when the Holy Spirit moves through someone and gifts someone to teach the Word, there's a gift of teaching, you know. It's done by the Holy Spirit. When that is an operation, the believers receive that and never again is that truth obscure like it once was. The portion that they understand and apprehend to themselves becomes a part of them. Now, one thing that we preachers have to learn is that because we've preached it two or three times, doesn't, and we may have preached it right, doesn't mean that everybody has apprehended it. Did you ever sit in a service and listen to a sermon, and then go and later on you get the tape and sit and listen to it, and you thought, I didn't hear that. You say, yeah, I've done that. Well, that's funny. You ought to preach a sermon and then go back and listen to it. I do that sometimes, but then I get discouraged. And I think, oh, my word. Oh, what a blooper, you know. You pick it to pieces, you know. You go after, you, when you're listening, when you preach the sermon and you listen to it, you, you think, oh, my lands. You pick out every obscure thing, everything that didn't wasn't clear, everything you forgot to finish, the points you didn't tie down before you left. You can hear it on the tape. It's very embarrassing. You said, you listen to your tapes? Not if I can help it. I just pray, Lord, get me moving in the right direction and show me the simple truth so I can share them with my people so they can grow up in the Lord. Amen? If you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus in your heart, of course, that's the biggest problem, greatest need in your life. Wouldn't you like to ask him in your heart? You could pray something like this, Lord Jesus, if I've never really trusted you as my Savior, I've never asked you in my heart, I'm asking you to come in my heart and save me. If you've never done it, do it now. Wouldn't you like to? And then if that doesn't settle the problems, the um, confusion that may be in your mind, by all means come forward, tell one of the workers who will be at the front, I need to talk to someone about salvation. And we'll get a worker to sit down with the Word of God, go over the plan of salvation, and help you to understand what God is doing in your life. And, 
then if that's uh, not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, you're tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops or reverses spiritual growth and progress, of course you're exhibiting signs of demonic activity in you, and you need deliverance. And if I were you, I'd come and seek help and deliverance from evil spirits. You say, well, I went up for prayer two or three times. Well, did you get rid of the problem? You say, no, I still have. Well, then all you did, you just went up for prayer two or three times and nothing happened. If at first you don't succeed, what? Try, try again. I'd keep coming till I got, got help. You say, well, it doesn't bother me that much. Well, no wonder you didn't get any help. God delivers people who are desperate, who desperately want to be different from what they are. Deliverance is not the only answer. It's just part of the it's part of the process that God is using to get us ready to walk with Him in a better way. It's not the whole thing, but what deliverance does, nothing else will do. You can't substitute other things for deliverance, and you can't substitute deliverance for other things. You're still going to have to read the Bible. You're still going to have to pray. You're still going to have to live a holy life. You're still going to have to relate to a bunch of believers and get in fellowship and stay in fellowship. You're still going to have to walk with God. But what deliverance does do, nothing, none of those things will do. God wants you to have all those plus deliverance. Uh, but deliverance will help all of those work better, easier, and make them flow better. Amen? So praise the Lord. Let's stand and sing something about that name. If you have a need, by all means come. Someone will be here to minister to your needs.